Speak, O Lord, for your servant is listening. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So I remember when I was nine years old, Mexico 86 was happening. So me and my two older brothers decided to scrounge together our pennies. Well, better said pesetas. And we uh, started buying these collector uh, cards for all of the teams for the FIFA World Cup 86. So I had to get my hands on Gary Lineker. I had to get my hands on Diego Armando Maradona. I had to get my hands on Butragueño's card and Michel's card. I had to get all the cards. I was only nine years old, so what did that mean? I was scrounging together my allowance. My brothers and I were doing extra chores around the house. We were trying to, like, find coins that were laying around the barrio. And, yes, that even meant taking those cards and going to school and trading five of this card for two of that card just because some of these cards were rare. Some you couldn't get your hands on. But after six months, we managed to put together the whole of Mexico 86. Now, that being said, I wish my mom would have kept that because... I'm sure that Diego Armando Maradona's card right now would be worth a pretty penny. But uh, don't have that anymore. But anyway, we, we read in this story um, of the call of Samuel. This idea of Samuel hearing a call from the Lord. It says, the word of the Lord was rare. Now, why is Diego Armando Maradona's card rare? Because, yeah, you, you'd buy a packet of cards and you might get some no-name guy from Denmark five times. But you're only going to get Diego Armando Maradona's card like one in 10,000 packets that you open. So the whole point, it's, it's precious because it's rare. So I, I just want to spend some time and hover over that one word. So we, we, wrote, we read four different passages of Scripture. We read from 1 Samuel. We read from Psalm 139. We read from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we read from John 1. But I want to just hover over one word, the word rare. And it's going to tell us three things about epiphany. Three things about how God speaks to us. One, when God speaks to us, it's rare. When God speaks to us, it's precious. And when God speaks to us, it's costly. Why is something rare? Because you don't find it a lot. Why is something costly? Or why is something precious? Because of the whole idea of supply and demand, um, the less you have of something, the more it's worth, right? Right? And then the more it's precious, the more it costs, the more you'll do to get that. So let's just hover with that. Let's look at why it was rare. So in this story of Samuel, Samuel is a young boy who's been apprenticed by his mother Hannah to Eli. Now at this point, Eli is a priest in the tabernacle. The, the temple hasn't been established in Jerusalem yet. Cultic worship is still happening in Shiloh. This is about 1100 or 1200 BCE um, in what was once the land of Canaan. I now it's, it's becoming the land of Israel. Um, and sometimes we look at these stories and people say, well, those are just interesting stories or myths. And I was reading um, uh, Joam Finkelstein, who's an archaeology professor from Tel Aviv, uh, and he was together with, with uh, another professor from Texas, how they were digging around Shiloh in 2017. And guess what? They were looking at the strata from 1200 BC, and then they looked at a strata from 1100 BC. And they found quite a bunch of pork ribs. In fact, I had some pork ribs last night. Um, and then, like, by the 1100s, the number of pork ribs, like, well, the number of pig bones, like, dropped to, like, less than 1% of all animal bones they find in the, the 1100s are pork. Well, I wonder why that is. Oh, yeah, maybe they're eating kosher there. So the whole point is that it, we have this archaeological evidence that, that there's a people group uh, living in Shiloh, engaged in cultic worship, where there's a lot of animals being sacrificed in Shiloh. So we, we have this archaeological evidence that there was something happening in Shiloh. So Samuel's there. He's apprenticed to Eli, this priest. And, and unlike priests today, we, we, you know, we do bread and wine. They were barbecue artists back then. So, I mean, think about that. You're, you come here. I'm not handing you extra, like, you know, beef ribs or anything like that. You're, you get bread and wine. But it's still great. The point is that Samuel uh, is being apprenticed to Eli in this trade of being a priest. And uh, in part of his daily routine, he, you know, works during the day and sleeps at night. He, he hears... Uh, a name called. He hears Samuel, Samuel. So he gets up and he just runs to Eli because obviously Eli must call him quite a bit. And he recognizes Eli, Eli's voice. So he goes to Eli and he says, so what do you want from me? And to Eli, since he was sleeping, as you and I all really enjoy when someone wakes you up, um, 
is a bit annoyed and says, could you just go back to bed? I didn't call you. So Samuel lays back down, and once again, Samuel hears Samuel. So what does, what does he do? He gets up, and, and here's the thing about when God speaks. Sometimes we think that it has to be this kind of Damascus moment, which we're going to get to in two weeks' time. Have you noticed that, like, the confession of St. Peter and the, the, the conversion of St. Paul all happens in Epiphany? There's a reason for that. It's the idea that God breaks in to speak to us, these epiphanies. Epiph but they're not these extraordinary supernatural things. Sometimes they're very natural. God speaks to us in a natural way. He's supernaturally natural, and sometimes he's just naturally supernatural. That's what's happening. And sometimes we think, oh, the word of God is rare. You know, that's what 1 Samuel verse 1 said, right? But have you ever thought about this? I mean, I have a four-year-old, and I remember over this Advent season, we were looking at 1 John, uh, John 1, sorry. And it says the word, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And then it says in John 1, 14, and the word dwelt among us. The word, how do you translate to a four-year-old, right? Well, God's a chatterbox. He's always speaking. The question is, are we listening? I mean, think about even the genius of this, right? The genius of your own biology, right? You have two ears and one mouth. And the word of God was rare. Is it rare because God is not speaking? Or is it perhaps because in that same kind of ratio, we're not doing the listening, but we're doing a lot of the talking? Are we doing the listening? God's always speaking, and God's asking us to listen. The Word of God isn't rare because He's not speaking anymore. It's because we're not listening anymore. And something's rare, it's precious because it's rare. Because it doesn't happen much, you know, if I don't have much of this particular widget, then that, this widget is going to go up in value because it, the, the widget is, there, there's a lot more supply. I mean, there's, a, there's low supply and high demand. So the Word of God was precious in those days. And, and I love that about the word in Hebrew. Like, we don't need to go on that. Yes, someone says, don't say the word is this in Hebrew. Yes, everyone knows that you went to seminary and you can do Hebrew. But the, the same word in Hebrew means precious, it means rare, and it means costly. That's why we're hovering on that same word. But it's precious. Why is it precious? Because it's, it's something out of the ordinary. It's something that isn't cheap. It's something that, that, that is expensive. It's precious. If you've ever read the book by Dietrich Bonhoeffer called The Cost of Discipleship, he wrote this book in the 1930s, and it was as this German theologian who was part of the Lutheran churches, which is our sister church over in Germany, if you want to think of, think of that. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer wrote this book, The Cost of Discipleship, because he was seeing a particular movement in the politics of his day. Where, where people were, were looking to politics to save them, to deliver them, to, to rescue them. And as Dietrich Bonhoeffer looked at it, he saw the rise of the Nazi party. Tomorrow, for example, we're going to celebrate uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, day. We're going to celebrate his life and his legacy, the, the idea that human beings are made in the image of God, which isn't Martin Luther King Jr.'s idea. That's God's idea. But the whole point with, with, with Dietrich Bonhoeffer was saying, the reason why all you folks are buying into what this particular political party is selling you is because you believe in something that isn't precious. It's cheap. It's cheap grace, not costly grace. So let me read you this line out of his book. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. And did you see this? Nathaniel is called by Jesus to discipleship, and he calls him to leave everything and follow him. Why? Because it's a costly grace. And he goes on to say this, costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field for the sake of which a man will gladly go and sell all that he has if it is the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant has. He will give everything for Jesus Christ. See, God's word is rare, but it's also precious. 
And you and I will do anything and everything to hear from someone that we really love and value. So what does Samuel do? He goes to, to Eli and he says, did you call me? And Eli's like, dude, it was your baked beans from last night. Just lay back down. So he lays down. He does that three times, right? Normally when something happens in Scripture three times, it's because God's trying to get our attention. So on the third time, Samuel goes back. And, and here's the thing. The way that Samuel is doing this is that God's communication is so ordinary that we miss the extraordinary for the ordinary. God calls us, and he speaks to us through other Christians, through creation, through our conscience, through the Bible. And so the point is it's easy to miss what God's saying, not because his word is rare, but because we don't find what he's saying is precious. So Eli says, next time you lay down, I want you to wake up, because it's not me, and this is the third time you've woken me up, it's really annoying, could you just say these words? Say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. God's word is precious. Speak. I, I'll be quiet. I'm going to do that whole ratio of listening instead of talking. I'm going to actually just be, instead of running to do something, some activity to run to Eli, I want to listen to what you have to say. And that's what leads us to the last bit. God's word in those days was rare. God's word in those days was precious. God's word in those days was costly. It's costly. And why is it costly? Because, you see, we're about to come to the world's most expensive meal. And you've heard me say this before. It's the world's most expensive meal because it costs God everything. And yet it's the world's freest and cheapest meal because it didn't cost you anything. Families eat at a table, and the Lord welcomes us to this table to come and sit and eat with him, that he might share his life with us and we might share our life with him. But it means that we have to do what Nathaniel did, which is it's going to cost us something. It's even going to be what St. Paul was talking about. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So honor God with your body. Honor him. Give yourself to him. He gave himself to you. Why won't you give yourself to him? And in doing that, I think you'll find like what this, this, I'd say young man, but he wasn't that young when he started writing this. It's called Practicing the Presence of God. And over this epiphany, when we look over the next five weeks, the, the ideas of everyday encounters, um, I want you to do what Brother Lawrence did. Brother Lawrence was this Frenchman who was part of the Thirty Years' War. It was Protestants against Catholics and whatnot. But he, was, he fought in that war, and then after that, he, took, uh, he became a lay brother in the Discalced Carmelites. And it's interesting because his book, Practicing the Presence of God, was such a great book that it, it's read by Protestants, it's read by Catholics, it's, been, it's, had a been, it's had a great influence on Christian spirituality. John Wesley used to read this book. A.W. Tozer used to read this book. So we're talking about people that aren't even Roman Catholics that read this book. But Brother Lawrence says this about God's costly presence that comes to us, that extraordinary thing that comes to us in ordinary ways. And he says... This is one of his prayers. He says, Lord of all pots and pans and things that make me a saint by getting meals and washing up plates, Lord, make yourself known to me in the ordinary. This epiphany season, the word of God isn't rare. He wants to talk to you. He wants to have that relationship. I mean, did you, did you catch that in Psalm 139? Lord, you have known me. You've searched me out. You know everything about me. The God, the maker of the universe, wants to call you by name. Just like he said, Samuel, Samuel. Just like he says, Bart, Bart. Or just like, just like he says, Judy, Judy. God, there's 8.2 billion people on this planet. But he wants to communicate to you personally, individually, to let you know how much he loves you. And he loves you so much that he does exactly what he did in John chapter 1, verse 14. The word, the chatterbox, became flesh and dwelt among us. Because he wants to not just share his word with us, he wants to share his life with us. So Lord, in this epiphany season, we want to admit that your word, you Jesus Christ, are rare. You are precious and you are costly. And Lord, we will give anything to get near to you, 
to be with you, to share your life. So speak to us, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen.